All right, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 3, and we're going to finish up our series, UFO. We are going to be finishing up worshiping UFOs. Never thought you'd say that coming out of a pandemic, did you? No, 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 you didn't. Yeah, Acts chapter 3, um, we're finishing this series. If this is the first time you've uh, joined us today or online, we've been in this series called UFOs, the ultimate freedom opportunity. And we want to worship our Lord for ultimate freedom opportunities. Amen. Amen. Not little green men flying around everywhere, nothing like that. No, no, no. We have been given ultimate freedom opportunities. We want to use those ultimate freedom opportunities. Just as Jason read in the gospel, what we wanted you guys to hear at the Great Commission was what? All authority in heaven and earth was given to who? A bunch of fishermen, a bunch of derelicts, even people that were zealous for government and all these other things. Jesus said, I pick you anyway, go. And just as Lori read, when they got their practice trial, when he sent them out for just amongst Israel, it made sure to read who these people were. And they had a freedom to get out and go. There was no qualification. They didn't have to have a church membership. They didn't have to know how to vote. Or they didn't have to have so many Bible verses memorized. No, God said, if I redeemed you, you are good enough to go, Sam. That's just the way it is, because you're a hick. Plural. Ha, ha, ha. Bad joke. All right. So... The last thing I want to talk about this week, I think the best ultimate freedom opportunity that I could try to identify to us as a collective and individuals is the idea of swag. Now, I understand that uh, the word swag kind of has generational connotations. Uh, many, many, many years ago, uh, I even tried to look up the etymology of the word swag. Okay, <laughs> like this morning, I'm like, hmm. how about just think about 50 years ago, swag might be thinking of a, a real treasure, okay? Like uh, something that was ill-gotten, like somebody sold some swag, like some high-dollar jewelry. And if you think over the last maybe I don't know, 15, 10, 5 years, swag's kind of taken this, this different approach, okay? When we think of swag now, a lot of times we think of swag as, you know, you go to a church and you get a free what? You know, mug, or you get a bracelet with, you know, some type of night to shine on it. Or you can go to your dentist and he'll, they'll even give you, all right? Okay? They'll even give you swag to floss your teeth. And if you go to a trade show, like I used to do at my old job all the time, they will give you ultimate swag. I mean, you get a keychain, you get little lights to put on people, you get something to open your beer with. Not here. Okay. <laughs> it was a joke. All right. It is a bottle opener. I don't know. All right. Like you've had it and you can get all sorts of swag when you go somewhere. Now, I wanted to use this term because I saw the news on Monday. And if any of you saw the news on Monday, you may be familiar with this particular swag bag, stuff we all get. Okay. When you go somewhere to a trade show, they give you a little bag and you fill it up. That's your swag, stuff we all get. Now, if Hollywood tends to believe they're better than the rest of us. So when they elevate themselves and give themselves awards every year, this year they decided to up it for everyone who was even nominated for an award. Because we live in a world that gives out trophies. And look what they gave them. They gave everyone who was nominated for one of these awards this swag bag. Now ask me what's in there. I have nothing. I don't know. Some creams. I really tried to look. I couldn't identify a brand. I couldn't identify what that stuff was. But do you know how much that swag bag totaled? $205,000. Stop it. America. The people who are influencing our culture. I see your faces now. I woke you up. This should have sting us all. The people who are affecting culture at the highest level are giving out swag bags that are worth more than the average home in this county. And you know what they'll do with that swag? They'll throw it away. You know why they gave it to each other? Because they truly believe that they deserve it. That their message is so important that they want to thank each other with little statues like idols. And then say, Here's another little bag of swag along the way. No, you're doing a good job. Church, this should terrify us. Believers in Christ, if you don't like the way the world is, I want you to stop and think. Are we not all a swag bag? If all of us, right, are redeemed by Jesus and we have a place in the body. Tom has a place in the body. I have a place in the body. You online have a place in the body. Julie, you have a place in the body. Bob, you have a place in the body. And we all come together as a local church and we are all redeemed in 
invaluable because of what Jesus did for you, Dwayne. We are a way better swag bag than that. Amen? I want to be a better swag bag than that. And every one of us in here, if we can walk out of here and just be this little bit of a light and just do our part, I assure you this, we will continue to see God put light in dark places. And in Acts chapter 3, there's a great playbook, I think, on this ultimate freedom opportunity, this ultimate swag bag giveaway, okay? And this is right after you've seen, you know, Pentecost happen, and all right, the Holy Spirit's come down, everyone's in Jerusalem, everybody's come in on a pilgrimage, and the church is starting to grow. They've seen thousands come to Christ, and, and now all the, the church is starting to take form. The, the original swag bags starting to get together. All the fishermen, all the weirdos, all the people that were freaked out by the others because they saw the Holy Spirit working, all of them coming together to be a little bit different. The first swag bag. But they didn't just come together to swag. I want you to catch what they're doing in Acts chapter 3. If you pick up in verse 1. It says, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. And now a crippled man from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those who were going to the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. And so the man gave them his attention, expecting. I want you to shout expecting on the count of three. I want you to type it in. I want everybody to wake up because I got something to tell you, and this is important. One, two, three. Expecting. Say it again. Expecting. One more time. Expecting to get something from them. Okay. Let's kind of put ourselves just at this part of the story, okay? Let's break it down, put it in context. Who is there? We know who. Peter is there. Who else is there? Somebody talk. Carlos, who else is there? John, they got it. You were wrong. You guys better wake up. All right? And then you have somebody who was crippled from birth, being carried to the temple at prayer time, right? Never been able to walk in his life. And ironically, okay, Luke wanted you to know this. He was being called to what temple gate? The one that was called beautiful. Did you catch that? All right, get ready. This is important. He wouldn't have put it there unless it was important, Sharon, so get ready. Because what you're going to see in this swag bag, how you see it works, this ultimate freedom opportunity I'm talking about, you're going to see it all right here. you got to remember, okay, Peter and John are nobodies. They have done nothing good to have been saved. They are just like all of us. God came to them in his grace. God redeemed them by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. All right, so now the only thing that makes them different than the others is the Holy Spirit is inside of them. They're saved. These people aren't yet. And they are still doing what? Just because they had a life-changing moment with Jesus and they see Jesus do miracles, they don't just go, well, that was enough for me. Now I'm not going to do anything anymore. No. What does Luke say? He says, at the time of prayer, at 3 with the expectation, are you're doing as you're supposed to be doing. You're going along the way. These guys are being faithful. They didn't have a Jesus moment and just leave. No, they have a Jesus moment and they're tuned in. And they want to keep moving forward. And that's what they're doing. And along the way, as they're going up to pray, these other people are carrying this man. Now, this may, I need you to wrap your mind around this. Because for Peter, James, and John, they haven't stopped learning. I want you to catch that too. It's not like they were like, I walk with Jesus, redeemed by Jesus, filled with Jesus' spirit, I'm good enough. No, these guys are going to keep learning in the process as well. And they're going to practice what they preach. So, as they're walking up, they would have been walking up to the temple, just like the Pharisees, just like the Sadducees, just like the Essenes. Now, Essenes are kind of referenced once in the New Testament. For a lot of us who, who, who you, you may not know that, but maybe if you want a little history, uh, the Essenes were, think of the Pharisees on steroids, okay? Like, so they believed pretty much everything that we believed, except Jesus was just, they, they couldn't quite get to the Jesus part. The Sadducees just believed the Ten Commandments, and, and they were a political party. So don't, don't, don't think like them. The Pharisees are the ones you got to have a little emotion for, right? Well, the Essenes, okay, they believed just about everything, but 
like the Pharisees, but then they were just a little different because they didn't even want to be around you, Linda. They were just like, nope, you're not like us. And they went and they hid out in the mountains and they would only come down for holiday. They thought they were holy and they didn't want to touch you, Sam. They were just like, stay away. And so they'd actually go live outside. That's where the Essenes are. They would only come in for something like this. And then you have the way. Now, I know that word in this community, if you've been here 20, 30 years, could carry some connotations. But biblically, at this time, they weren't calling themselves the ecclesia, the church. They were calling themselves the way. That's, that was the first kind of connotation that was put on the Christian church. And the Christian church believed also in the same things of the Bible. Well, it made them different. They believed Jesus was Messiah. And they didn't just believe, but they were what? Filled with Messiah. But they're still going to worship at the same place. Now, as you put yourself in this, this is what I love about the church. Because I am sure when the Essenes saw this crippled man carried to the gate on the way to pray, they would not dare have touched this man. Under no circumstance would they have even gotten close to this man. The Sadducees probably for sure wouldn't because their religion was just a bunch of talk. It literally meant nothing to them. They were all about political gain at that time. They thought the way to overthrow the Roman oppression was through politics. So they would not have done that. And the Pharisees, they've demonstrated at this point, they just can't go all the way in to understand that their what? Practice of their faith comes before the actual worship of their faith. You get it? Now the Christian church, they're moving the way. And so now these two apostles are like, we're told to make disciples of all nations, like Jason's talking about. I don't even know where to go. And then they get the one who would have been disqualified. Now, <laughs> if you read John chapter 9, write this down. I'm not going to make you go through all of this. This is so important, okay? Because this is the ultimate swag I think everyone in the world needs to gain today. This is what made the church, or at this time, Peter and John, just a little bit different. See, when they saw this man who literary context saying the unredeemable is at the beautiful gate, they had eyes to see. They've been down this road before because a year or two before that, Peter and John and the rest of the disciples are walking with Jesus and they see a man who's crippled. And when they see this crippled man, they ask Jesus a question. In John chapter 9, it says, As they went along, he saw a man blind, I'm sorry, blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? Now catch this. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now catch this, this is the most important part. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, as Jesus asked, said Jesus, but this happened so that a work of God might be displayed in his life. There was a time where people would look at those who were not like them, such as somebody who would have been blind or crippled or disabled, and they would have looked at them, and the idea floating around for thousands and thousands of years was they were in this circumstance of life. They had this disability, inability, whatever cultural word you want to use, okay? It was there because their parents sinned, and so therefore the child was being what? Punished. And under no terms were you to touch this punished creature. At best, you were to pity this person. But when they asked Jesus, hey, look at this blind man. He's just sitting around begging with a cup. Who sinned, Jesus? And what does Jesus say? No one. This happens so that God may be glorified. This is a totally different way of thinking. What did Jesus do? He gave this person dignity. Now, do not run away from this word, because as I have been praying this morning and all day, I could just camp on that one word, dignity. Because dignity, as I've been thinking about life, and I look at the political, I look at the economic, I look at the spiritual, I look at the philosophical, I look at the schools, I look at the medical community, and everyone doesn't like each other. They don't. And we get so dug in, right? We go, okay, Ben, I know I'm supposed to give dignity to, to Ryan. Well, you've already not given him dignity by looking at the chair. Let's just call it what it is. Make it awkward, right? We get that lesson. 
We get, okay, Ben, I understand. We're all white. We need, yes, you understand that. That's good. You say, okay, Ben, I understand women maybe not pay. Fine. You grasp that. I'm not talking about that. I'm going to get to relevant to us for a moment. Dignity for us in our culture, in our context, is anyone who doesn't think like us, and often we just start to put into some type of camp. We look at the way they're dressed. We look at the, the, the size that they are. We, we look at the car they drive. We look at the house they have. And immediately we think some type of judgment upon them. I do. I don't like it. Yeah, thank you, Bob. All right, the most sanctified just said amen. You do it, right? You sit, oh, oh, okay, I did this to you once, and she did this to me. Do you remember when I rode your tail all the way into town one morning? I was running late, and I got behind this car, and I was so angry. They was like, get out of my way, get out of my way. And I had formed a judgment on Bruce coming down 20 and then started to realize, uh-oh, this guy's pulling into our parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I saw who got out of the car, and I've got to get up and preach, uh-oh, because I know he'll fight back. So I learned that lesson a long time ago. But boy, I had formed about 15 thoughts about Bruce without even seeing who got out of the car. That's taking dignity away from him. That's not just heaping judgment, that's taking dignity. So this morning, I'm rolling in now a different way, and I'm coming up three, and I get into the light in town, and this car just right on my back. And I'm like, what is going on? I'm driving through town, trying to honor the speaker, oh, Carlos. You know, no to do to do. I don't want to get in trouble. I know not to tell. Why is this person tailing me? And then we pull in. They pull in right behind me. They pull in. I'm like, oh, I'm going to give it to Erica. <laughs> I don't know whose car you were driving, but I had formed about 15 thoughts and undignified her in the process. We can undignify anybody at a stoplight. We don't have to look at what ability, color, or gender they are. We easily can dismiss the beautiful on what the world says is not beautiful at the temple gate or at the stoplight. When we're on our way to worship. You see where I'm going now? Yeah, you caught me. <laughs> Your ultimate freedom opportunity can kick right in. And what makes the Christians different than the Essenes, than the Pharisees, and the Sadducees? They stop and give worth to the undignified. I don't, don't matter what car this guy's driving, doesn't matter if he's in a chair. Now, here's the part I love that I made you shout. Remember? Let's go back to that story now. <laughs> this man who's being carried in, right? What did it say he had? He had what? Expectations, right? That these people would take care of him. He's not a believer. He's a taker of the system. He gets carried in and panhandles. <laughs> Pretty easy to think that way, isn't it? Because that's what it says. The irredeemed has been carried to the redeemable gate, and the Christians come along the way, and James and John are looking at this, and they're like, I'm not making that mistake again. I remember when Jesus gave sight to the blind that first time. We're going to do something about this. And then comes the question for all of us that we can identify with, but I'm not mastered in the Bible. I don't know everything there is to know. I didn't go to seminary. How do I give worth to the worthless? What am I supposed to? to do. Well, giving them dignity is the very first piece of swag you can give out. Every time you look at something and you go out this week and you see what they're not like about you, just stop for just a second and go, maybe they have something that could complete me. That's a challenge in and of itself. Because I know not everybody is Bruce Burns driving a car slow. Some of them Need a lot of freedom opportunities. I get that, okay? Some of them get that. But this guy has expectations. And I want to ask you, now we have, we, 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 got, we got to throw our, our feelings on the Oscars, but let's stop back now at that swag bag and let's see what the irredeemed say. They have expectations of us, the church, to give out swag, Right? That's what the crippled man did. He had expectations. What do you think the world thinks about 
when they think about the church today? What kind of swag do you think they think is coming out of the body of Christ? When people think about the word church who aren't Christians, who aren't part of the body of Christ, what do you think they think about? Because they have expectations. I came up to this one right here because I get to hear it all the time. This was the best meme I found. This is what the world's expectations or thoughts of the church have become. I really enjoy all your religious posts on Facebook. You ever consider modifying your behavior to match them? That's why I don't even put my kids on Facebook anymore. It's rough. If, and I know those of you who don't have social media, okay, but everybody else who has a feed, and you go back and you read that, and you look at all your Christian posts, ooh, make sure your other posts match the, the words coming out because that's what the world sees. If that's all we're showing them is a meme, is a clever one. Hey, I've seen some really funny ones. At times, I've wanted to put out there too, and I'm like, ooh, can't do that. Believe me, I have the itch to forward. Dwayne. All right. (laughs) I got the itchy finger. I know what it feels like. But when people look at me, I don't want them ever remembering some slighty post. I want them always looking at me and not thinking about a pastor. I want them looking at me and thinking at Jesus. And I get to do that every time I encounter someone who's actually not like me. And you know what I do? I look at them, Gary. And if they're not like me, I always try to think like the disciples and go, they have an expectation of me. And if I know this is the expectation, I have a chance to beat it by flipping the way I act, right? Everyone in here has an expectation. You know what? I don't know what your expectations are, but they come at you fast. Just like I was giving the illustration about driving down the car, okay? Let me give you a really quick one. I know for a fact that I gave my wife cash on Friday to go get some fish, Do you know how I know and I know how much? Because she didn't give me the change. (laughs) I know I gave my daughter some cash yesterday to go get some food. It was a lot of cash. She came back with none. You know why I know that? And I'll always remember that? Because I had an expectation to get what? Change. We have an expectation in every exchange we have with a human being, right? Right? And their expectation, the world's, way too often is that we do not practice what we preach. So every time you see the unredeemable in the redeemable spot, that's the only freedom you have is to change the way you think. And the change way we think is to look at them and say, I, do, I know Tom's not like me, so I'm going to beat it to the punch. And I'm going to go, oh, is Tom not like me? How can Tom complete me? If we start looking at things that way, And you've got the people at your work. They don't have to be at the stoplight. This becomes the swag that makes the bag. But we have to take on this mindset that's not like the other religious people of the day. Now, there are some simple simple concepts of this swag, okay? Do, Do not miss this, okay? I want you to see, it's not just that these people have expectations and we need to make them up, okay? It's not just the dignity piece. But I want you to see what happens, okay? Let's go back in uh, verse uh, four. It says, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. What did he say? He said, look at us. Eye contact is huge dignity, is it not? That's a hu- Do you want to know if I don't respect you? Talk to me and watch me just... I'm being honest. I'm showing my till, okay? I really am. I have learned, and (laughs) I'd say over the last year, because we had to watch ourselves online so much and how much I closed my eyes, okay? Like, it was a big thing. And I know I freak a lot of you out when you come, and I'm like, ah, 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 and I can talk at you. But I also know this, okay? What is it? Oral communication is only 12% of communication. You know, the rest is nonverbal. So eye contact is what? Everything. That's a small way to show dignity to people, is it not? All right, if you're sitting here like, okay, Ben, I get it. What, okay, start with looking somebody in the eyes. And if you know I can't even do that, then that's where you got to check your spirit right there. I can't make eyes with Connie. She's just terrible. <laughs> or, or I feel her eyes are judging what? Me, which means maybe there's something what? Wrong with 
me instead of me just undignifying Connie. Life is a thought process, brothers and sisters. And sometimes these small things are like, okay, get dignity. All right, just start looking people in the eyes. How long can you do it? How hard is it? What emotions do you go through when you say, look at me? You have expectation of me, now you look at me. We know this, right? We know how this goes. The other day, four, and this is also, okay, four, Reagan got her fourth spanking in history. Because if you spank Reagan, it doesn't work, okay? I, I've just learned that kids have to be punished differently. It doesn't work, but I, I do not spare the rod, okay? Like, if it's got to go, and the mighty hand of justice has got to go. Now, here's the problem. I may have withheld the rod too long, and let me tell you why. I knew this. Because Reagan had a full-blown meltdown at my grandparents two weeks ago, okay? It doesn't matter what she did. She's standing outside, and she is totally defying her mother. And usually when she steps in and defies Kristen, at that point, okay, I know Ben needs to step in, right? There's the expectation. Kristen tags me in, it'll all be over. Not this time. Mm -mm. She has figured, you know what? I'm just going to push six foot one dad a little bit harder. And I am not giving, it was a robin's nest with eggs in it. Yeah, she turned into that person, all right? Like, and she's like, I'm not giving this up. And I'm like, yes, you will. And she was screaming, like screaming in my grandparents' neighborhood. And guys, I just, I don't know. I don't like spanking. I, I just finally, I picked her up like fast, okay? Took her into my grandparents' took her into the second living room, put her on the couch, all in one swift movement. De parents don't look at me with judgment. You know what I'm talking about. Please. <laughs> and so I pick her up, I put her down, and I go to give her her first lash of my mighty hand of justice. And do you know what she did? She looked me in the eyes and smiled. <laughs> now you know. But then what did I do? I didn't break eye contact, Bonnie. No, no, no. I came with the second and the third and the fourth. You want to make this a fourth generation spanking, then you get four lashes from Almighty Dad. And I'll tell you what, my look, not breaking at her, do you know what it did? It broke her. The laugh on the first one when she saw I wasn't kidding, it wasn't about the, it wasn't about the pain, right? Her tush could take it. It was about the expression on her father's face when she saw it. Eye contact is everything, brothers and sisters. I know this feels like I'm teaching you a Tony Robbins seminar or something like that, but listen, this is powerful stuff that you can practice every single day by giving people dignity. How you look at them is everything about how we reflect God to others, is it not? When people see my eyes, I hope that they don't see judgment. I hope they truly see, hey, this guy cares. I don't win every day, and you're not going to win every day. But if we turn our eyes upon Jesus, gosh, I love that song. Thank you, Lori, for singing that. I just start crying when you sing that song. Okay? When we turn our eyes upon Jesus, everything changes, right? The way we look, the way we act, all of a sudden we see, what? The irredeemable and the redeemable spot. We know we've got to give this person dignity. We know I've got to look them in the eyes. And then after that, the other swag bag thing that he gives them, that I just, this is simple stuff, okay? I want to make sure you catch. And I'm going to pick up uh, in verse 6. Follow with me. It says, Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly his man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. And then he went to them in the temple courts, walking and jumping. And, say, and they all recognized him, and this is the same man who was sitting and begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at all that his happen. No, it's not just his eyes I want you to see that they put on him. The other thing I want to make sure that you catch is that they actually did what? They touched him. Now, eye contact was big, and that was a hard thing for me to talk about, me looking in the eyes, okay? Now let's talk about touch. Touch in a time where? When we're told not to what? Touch. Have you ever wanted to be touched now more than ever? When touch is taken away, oh, we'll throw some conspiracy theories. We'll do whatever it takes. You want to know why? That's normal. You were made that way. You weren't made to be alone. You're this church. I love you, Randy. I've given you so much every, you know, okay, like, 
a most honest man in my life, you are becoming a good pastor. He never says a good pastor. He says becoming. And you know what? Yes, this church has been great to me to help me grow up a lot in life along the way. And one of the ways is hugging Nancy. It's hugging therapy with Jason. I have slowly turned into a hugger. And then when I was told not to stop, it felt what? Weird. What did I do, Tammy? I walked in. My first instinct is to be a pastor, right? You had surgery. I walked, I'm like, ah! And then I became a statue. I don't know what to do. Do you know psychologically the human being needs to be touched seven times every day? Skin to skin contact. Every human being. I read that in an article that was terrifying about the elderly during this time. It was horrifying. So, why is this so important? Where is the swag of dignity in this? One of the first miracles Mark records in Mark chapter 1. You can write it down or you can go there. Leading out of the gate to talk about who Jesus was. All right, Jesus is walking through the towns. He's doing these miracles. People have no idea who he is. He's just brought the disciples along the way. They're moving around the lake. And then Luke, or Mark, wants to make sure that you catch one of the first things Jesus does. It says, in verse 40, it says, A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And filled with compassion. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Why would that have been so important? Okay, remember, this is an unredeemable person at a redeemable spot. And they look at him and they say what? Look at me. They look back at him. And they say, this is what I do not have. I don't have money. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus. And what does he give him first? He touches him. Just like Jesus, three years before, touched a leper who should never have been touched. That's coronavirus on the skin. That's the first thing Jesus does, right? He puts his hand on this man. It says out of what? Compassion. He saw this broken person. And the disciples are like, all right, I know we give this guy dignity. Let's look at this man. Let's tell him what we don't have, but not just disqualify ourselves, but give him what we do have. And the first thing they do is they touch this man. A man that should not have been what? Touched. And they put their hand on him anyway. That had to have been for this man enough to just, I'm good. I'm good. I've been looked at, they talk to me, they touch me. But Jesus doesn't just stop there, does he? No, 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 no. See, when we give all dignity to all people, no matter where they come from, and we recognize what we do not have on our own, I don't know how to preach, I don't know the Bible, I don't have money. I don't have a second home to give you. I don't know how to pray in public. I don't, I don't, I know. But what do you know? You know that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. And whether you're a fisherman, a business owner, a stylist, I don't care what you do. If you've been redeemed by him, then you have all of him to give to somebody else. Not just in eyes, not just in touch, but fully in Jesus. And you know the swag that comes from that in the community? Oh, when people see the unredeemed redeemed and dancing around in the temple, they have awe oh, when they see a life. And listen to me right now. Some of you, I know how this works. Some of you are like, do you believe that Jesus can still heal people? Yes, I do. I do believe that. But here's what I know. That teaching has been turned. And what it's been turned into, it's been monetized. And somebody's walked around and said, Greg, if you just have enough faith and you come to me and you pay me, I'll put my hand on you and heal you. That's not how it works. But that's how the world has monetized it. And that's a false teaching from the pit of hell. But here's what I do believe. I do believe that the living God is inside of me. And I do believe when I recognize what I do not have and recognize fully what Jesus has given me, 
and I treat somebody like Jesus would treat them, I give them full dignity, I give them full eye contact, I give them full touch, and I say, I can't do this, but here's what I can do. I have seen so many lives changed throughout my time in ministry. And my guess is, is that anyone in this room that has ever stopped and you look at your lineage of disciples that you've made along the way in your life, whether it be your children or in your church, your Sunday school or wherever it is in your life, if you've seen someone come up through the ranks, if you've seen someone's life change, don't tell me that you're not in awe. The moment the body stops seeing awe of what God does, let me tell you something. We ought to be scared. If we aren't seeing God save lives, God change lives, God heal lives, we better be terrified. And it'd be good for all of us. Why well, I said when we give dignity and we don't take stuff away from people, it'd be good for all of us to remember what we don't have, but this morning remember what you do have. And you can give that freely away to anyone whether they don't know Jesus or whether they do know Jesus. If you stop and you show the dignity that the disciples did, because remember, they are like the ones that didn't go to the temple. They practiced their religion before they went into worship. They saw the irredeemable in the redeemable spot. They learned their lessons along the way. And now their chance is to put it into play. And when you walk out of here today, you're going to have that same opportunity. Your temple gate's going to be uh, the stoplight. Your temple gate's going to be Applebee's. Your temple gate's going to be your house. Your temple gate is going to be somewhere with some person. And you will have the opportunity today to say, I know what I do not have, but I do know this. I also have Jesus of Nazareth, and I can extend his power to you. But you got to really want to give it to them. And don't limit it to what God can do. And I'm going to ask the band to come up, but I want to show you probably the most transitional piece of swag in my life, trans transformational. It's a commentary on the book of Romans. I'm going to tell you how I got this commentary. Back in 2003, Thrivent or Lutheran Brotherhood, you guys know who they are, really were the first people to step out and make a Hollywood movie that was religious, okay? And it's a very, if you want to know my opinion, it's still like one of the best Christian flicks there is, okay? It's, it's about Martin Luther. It's called Luther. And uh, we had just moved to Alabama when that movie came out. And I was excited because it was really like pumping it up. You know what I mean? This was even before, um, what do you call it? The Passion of the Christ. This was like a, a trial run of a real professional movie with real actors. And it was done very well. Now, you have to remember, I have uprooted my whole life to go down and learn intellectually about God, okay? And so I am a freshman. We are like three, four weeks in. I am living in the, 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 <laughs> the hillbilly land of Alabama. And this movie came out. Now, for us to even go to a movie was a big deal. We had zero money. I mean, zero money. And yet, somehow, we mustered up, I don't know, the, <laughs> we had to go to the matinee. You know what I mean? Like, so we had to really dumb it down, okay? Like, the 12 bucks uh, to go, and our other friends that were poor, uh, you know, preachers in the making, right? They, they were there with us, and we, we spent our total of, I don't know, like $48 to go see Luther, you know, snuck in our juju beads because we couldn't afford it. We just, you know, well, I'm a pastor. I'll get away with watching Luther and sneaking in my food, all right? And we watched this movie, and there's only one other guy in the theater. That's it, one other guy. And I'm going to tell you, I like the movie. I was moved by the movie. It's a good movie. You ever want to borrow it? Come to my office and get it. And so we're getting out of the movie, and I go to the restroom, and I'm standing in the restroom, and this random guy who was in the movie theater, I've never met, and he's the only one not with the rest of us, walks in and makes that awkward time in the men's room. He just starts talking to me about the movie. So I'm giving him full dignity because you never know along the way, and I start talking back. Like, yeah, it was a great movie. He's like, yeah, it's a good movie. We start talking. I tell him my story. He's like, you know what you need? You need Luther's commentary on Romans if you're going to be a preacher. I'm like, yeah, it's a good idea. He's like, oh, there's a Christian bookstore next door. You should get it. I'm like, yeah, it's a good idea. He's like, well, let's go now. You ever done that? You said yes to a bunch of things and you're like, oh no, what did I just commit to? I have no money. 
And now my friends are like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. And it had that time where I'm like, hey guys, this is Russell and his wife and my wife, Kristen. And this guy's like, hi, I didn't even know his name. And now we're following random bathroom guy. And we walk out of random bathroom guy. We follow him into the Christian bookstore and we walk around and he looks around and my friends are like, what's going on? Kristen can tell you. She's just like, what are you doing? You've told me I can't even buy a stamp. I'm like, I know you have enough books. And I'm walking around following this guy. He is going, going. He cannot find the book. So you know what he does? He, I think, thank goodness. He can't find the book. He finds a clerk and tells her, how can you be a Christian bookstore and not have Luther's commentary on Romans? So the girl goes back and I'm like, oh my goodness, Kristen still has no idea what's going on. She will testify to this story. And I'm like, I don't know. My friends are like, I don't know. And they're looking around at books. I'm like, oh Lord, I can't afford it. Don't let it be. Don't let it be. And what does she come back with? The ultimate swag. $15, $14.99. And the lady hands it to me. I still got the sticker on it because it was so to me. And she hands me the book. And I remember thinking, I don't have $14.99. That's like three nights of dinner for us. And so she gives me this book. And I look at Random Bathroom Guy. And I, I thank Random Bathroom Guy. I'm like, thank you. I'll make sure to look at this. But you know my plan, right, was to, let's go, babe. I can't afford Luther's commentary. And he's like, oh, you'll love it. It'll help you in your class. Theology 101. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. He's like, you know what else you should need? And then he just goes on a bookstore run. And he's just throwing books on this pile. And it just gets heavier, not by strength, but by what? Money. And he's telling me what I need to do, telling me what I need to do. He is nothing but random bathroom guy to me. I don't know if he's in a cult. I don't know if he's a JW under disguise and they found a new way to do it. I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. And then with six books, okay, six books. Now that's like months of food to us. He has his pile. And I am like, thank you, random bathroom guy. And then he starts, what, neandering to the front. And I am now, I'm all in and look, Dwayne, I'm about as uh, Dave Ramsey as y'all. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, I don't want to put this on the credit card. Oh, I don't. And then Kristen's going to yell at me. And we're all the way on the way. Random bathroom guys talking about, I'm just about, how am I going to pay this off? Kristen's going to be so mad. I'm going to be poor. We're going to be paying interest. You know, all this stuff. And then as he's ringing it up and you see the books going in, you know what? He goes, oh, I got this. And he paid for it. He paid for it. And you know what? I don't know his name. He's a random bathroom guy. I know what I didn't have along the way. I know what I needed along the way. This random bathroom guy saw something in me that I needed. And I'm going to tell you, I never understood Christianity until I read this. Like, you know, the kind that you pay me to know. This is what changed the world. This writing is what took us into the Protestant church. And I remember going home and reading this and crying and thanking God that what I was given, it changed my life. Listen to me. There is a random bathroom guy in all of you. There's a random bathroom guy out there for me. And all of us have the opportunity when we go out today to be that ultimate swag bag. And know this, when you see dignity in somebody else, that swag's gonna come back at you. But I know this, this swag bag just right here, you online, this in the room, you're worth infinitely more than $205,000. I know that through you, God is changing the city. I know through you, he's changing the county. I know through you, he's changing the world. I know through you, he's going to continue to do it forever and ever and ever. All of you are a piece of swag if you give your life over to Jesus. An irredeemable bag of mixtures. Every one of us. And we can see Jesus make disciples in Africa or right out the door at the subway. What piece of swag are you going to be? Maybe you don't have the money, but you got the ability to pray. Maybe you don't have the Bible knowledge, you have the ability to love. Maybe you keep saying, Ben, I don't have, then start with this. Give someone dignity. Look them in the eyes. Just touch them. See what you don't have and know that you have in Jesus Christ something to offer through him.
if you just go along the way. Remember this, when Peter and John did this, they didn't hear a sermon, they did it before the sermon. So now you have six and a half days before the next sermon to go to the temple gate, to go out and be that piece of swag, to let the power of the Holy Spirit work through you. And why don't we believe this, that next week we will see people's lives changed. That next week you will see more come. That next week you won't just see their, their tushies back in the seat, but you'll see families redeemed. Isn't that what we want? Amen? Amen. Now, everybody stand with me right now. Listen to me. I don't know what your journey was on the way to get here. And I don't know what opportunities you may have missed. I know what I missed. But those opportunities are always in people before possessions. And I don't want to miss an opportunity this morning either. If a lot of you are out there and like, okay, Ben, I'm going to go out and be swag. I'm going to put dignity in people. I'm going to look at them and touch them. I'm going to give them what I don't have. Yes. But some of you, if you're thinking, Ben, this doesn't make sense, please, for the love of God, hear what I'm saying. You are not holy swag, what I'm referring to, if you do not know Jesus Christ. You will be at best costume jewelry in a bag. If you want to be a part of God changing the world or you just want peace in your life, you need the fullness of God inside of you. And I don't know this morning if, if, if you sat there and you felt like Jesus is far away, you know him, but you don't, please open yourself up today to let more of him in. This is a time where you should come and let Jesus into your life so you can go and give it out. So I want you to close your eyes for just a minute and, and think with me. Seek God with me. Because here's what I know. All of you have a storm you're going home to. All of you have a, you may get in the car, you have a storm before you get in that car and you get in and the storm just takes off. The world is in a storm. And the only one who quiets the storm is Jesus. I don't know if your storm's at home. I don't know if your storm's at your job, in your marriage, with your kids. I don't know. I don't know if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But this morning, I want us to just stop for a minute. And I want you to ask yourself, do I really know Jesus? Is he truly the authority of my life? Or have I gotten out of rank? Have I gotten out of step? Have I tried to just fully go MIA? Listen to me. Jesus will take you. Jesus looks at all of us as beautiful when he completes us. Jesus takes away the sin. Jesus takes away the guilt. And I know you hear that, but if you want to know that, know this. If you confess your sin, the Bible says that he is faithful to cleanse you of your sin and forgive you on all unrighteousness. He does it so we can shine. And so this morning, I know this. Whatever storm you're in, you have the same opportunity as the disciples, the same power to overcome that darkness by praising God. And praising God starts with recognizing where he's not in your life. Is he not at your job? Is he not in your home? Is he not in your family? And you say, how do I know? And I'll say this. It's, you know when you're in the place that you don't give people dignity. If you don't give your spouse dignity, if you don't give your kids dignity, you don't give your coworkers dignity, that's where you need to start. And you start by filling yourself with him. So in this moment, I want you to just close your eyes. I want you to think about whatever it is that's been the darkness of your life that you want to cast out this morning. Because I know you all want to go out and be swag but we all want to go out and be holy and redeemed, cleansed and ready to go.
getting ready to raise the hallelujah this morning. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a Almighty God, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm so joyful to just think how many opportunities we have this week, how many opportunities everyone in this room has 
right now. They have an opportunity to know you. They have an opportunity to go with you. We have that opportunity because you came to us, Jesus, and you saved us, and you made us the ultimate swag. God, thank you for this body. Thank you for what you're doing through every one of these individuals. And I know this, the dark places they are going out to this week, they have the opportunity to keep shining. But, oh, Lord, don't let us walk out of here without coming to know you in the full. For anyone in this room who's, who, who's, who's fighting with you today, I ask, God, that, that you would move in them, that you would open their hearts. And for those of us out that, that fully know you and say, all right, let us go, then, God, let's feed on that energy as well because there is a hallelujah to sing in the storm and on the mountaintop. And I want this body, these believers, this family to go out and have that same shout. Hallelujah. Almighty God, be with my brothers and sisters today. Be with wherever the place is that we go. Give us eyes to see. Give us courage to touch. Give us the heart of compassion to show dignity to anyone that's not like us. And oh Lord, <laughs> make us aware of what we aren't in the swag bag. So we are fully aware of who we are and what you've called us to be as well. I ask for all those prayers because everyone here is so different, Lord. But we all have you and we thank you for you. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Hey. Raise your hands up. It is so sunny outside. You know what? You will find somebody today to go put swag in, and you will be swag in return. Let's go out. Freely we have received, so freely we give. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine down upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord continue to look upon us all with favor, and may the Lord grant to us his peace. Hey, everybody, go and always shine brighter. I'm gonna sing in the middle